Oh, I spoke too soon. Stop, AJ. AJ. Did I hit record already? Darn it. Okay. Hi. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. You're fine, Alicia. Um, okay. So when we left off, we were talking about, we're starting to talk about the machine. And, you know, I said yesterday, I kind of talked about the flow and, you know, I'm going to build the parts and then I'm going to re-go through that whole flow again. But um, we have to start, there's some notes under here about the different parts. But the first thing we're going to start about is our compressed gas supply, which is our carrier gas. Um, and that's represented down here. And this is what the machines in surgery look like. Um, they have oxygen tanks that are attached to the machine. Um, and these are the two green tanks down here. And that is, so oxygen is a compressed gas. And we, it says it's, you know, room air is about 21% oxygen. And if we hook them up to a machine with oxygen, you can increase that to 30%. Although I will tell you when we run oxygen to a patient, we are running 100% oxygen. So they're not getting room air. When they're intubated and when they're hooked up to a machine, it's all controlled. You're delivering 100% oxygen. Now, if you're using a mask, they could pull in. I mean, you're mostly delivering 100%. They could pull a little room air in, but basically when they're on a machine, they're on 100% oxygen and, hi AJ, uh, you know, 100% oxygen, that's what we're delivering. And the reason we do this, there's two reasons to run oxygen to your patient. Number one, it's the carrier for the anesthetic. And two, we're supplying oxygen to maintain cellular metabolism. When they're under anesthesia, everything is depressed, all body functions, CNS, cardiovascular, respiratory. And by delivering oxygen to our patient at a higher concentration, then you can deliver, you know, you can help maintain normal cellular metabolism. Now, there are two main types of tanks that you need to know um, that deliver the, that, that hold the oxygen. Um, and there is a large volume in these tanks and they are held under a high pressure and that'll be important. The E tanks are the small ones like in this picture. So these are called E tanks. The way I kind of remember it is think about them being small and you could carry them in an emergency. E does not stand for emergency. That's just, you know, I always like to give you a way to kind of say, hey, maybe this helps you. But E tanks are the little tanks and they are typically attached to the anesthetic machine. Um, at Purdue, we had gurneys that were anesthesia gurneys and we could roll a patient throughout the hospital on oxygen and anesthetic. Um, sometimes, you know, they used to be for people that needed oxygen, you could get a little cart and you got, you know, little old lady with the tubing and she's dragging her tank. Um, so these are portable um, and they are holding oxygen under high pressure. Now, there are also H tanks and think about a big letter H. These are large and they are typically, um, found in what's called an oxygen bank. So we used to use these at the school the first time I taught here. And when I worked in um, Anderson, when I worked up at Northwood, back in our storeroom in the back of the hospital, we had about five of these large tanks and there was a central supply line and oxygen could be carried to various rooms. Um, and so if you go to a hospital and they have what's called an oxygen drop. So there's usually like a, a green hose that comes out of the ceiling and you can plug the anesthesia machine into the drop. If there's oxygen drops, that oxygen's coming from a central source. So a bank of tanks and uh, BCA has this as well. They have an oxygen room and it's just full of these oxygen tanks and they are under high pressure. The way they're set up at BCA, when one tank runs out, it'll automatically switch to the next tank and then the next tank. Now, when you get to the last tank, there we have an oxygen alarm system that will tell you like, hey, you're on your last tank of oxygen. There's a couple times we've had to have oxygen 
delivered on an emergency basis because we ran out um, of oxygen. So the H tanks, again, they're usually not in your service. There might be some clinics that have an H tank in their OR and it directly supplies the machine, but most of the time the H tanks are kept in a separate room. Now, let me also explain something about oxygen tanks. They are under high pressure. And when you have stored tanks, now when you have the machine, when you have these, they are attached to the machine via something called a yoke and they are secure. But if you have your backup tanks, um, sometimes, so in surgery at school, there's a cabinet between the prep room and surgery and the tanks are, um, held together with a chain so that they don't fall. If an oxygen tank was to be loose and fall, it's under pressure. It could become like a missile. It can literally go through a wall. It could break somebody's leg um, because, you know, so it's a major OSHA violation if they were to come in your clinic and your tanks were just sitting up. They have to be secured. Um, our banks um, have a double chain system that they chain them to the wall so that they cannot uh, tip over and fall. So that's a very important thing is that tanks, because they're pressurized, they have to be secured. You don't want to ever just sit an oxygen tank in the middle of the room. Um, you know, I don't even like to see them propped against a wall because if they fall, you know, someone could really get hurt. Um, so you have your E tanks and your H tanks and parts of the machine on top of the tank, there's something called the control valve and a standard is lefty, loosey, righty, tighty. If you want to turn on the tank, there's usually a, a dial, a valve. And if you turn it to the left, all of a sudden you'll hear, psh, like you'll hear the oxygen come out of the tank. So I usually turn it two or three times and typically on the top, there is a gauge. It's called the oxygen pressure gauge. Now, things you need to know for this test is what are things measured in. When you turn on a tank, it is, yeah, a, oh, think, H huge. There, that's perfect. H is huge. E, tiny E, H are huge. Both tanks, all oxygen is measured in what's called PSI which is pounds per square inch. So when you turn on a tank, there's a gauge and it'll be set to like zero. And usually there's like a red bar and it'll say full. So when you turn on the tank, if it's full, it'll read 2200 PSI. Let me type that in the chat because I want everybody to know that. Um, PSI is also the pressure in your tires, if that helps anybody. Yes, exactly. So PSI is a common way to measure pressure of something. So yeah, you might, that's a good point, that um, all full oxygen tank is 2200 uh, PSI. Now, what's interesting is an E-tank holds 2200 pounds. And an H tank holds 2,200 pounds. They hold both tanks when they're full. Even though an H tank is huge, it holds the same pressure. It just holds more of it. So it doesn't change, even though it's bigger. Both oxygen tanks, if they're full, should read about 2,200 PSI. And again, when, and when you look at a, um, and I think it's coming up, there's a picture. Um, Well, so here, this letter A is the H tank and B here is the E tank. And then this is an example of that cart. Like, you know, if you needed to carry, take oxygen somewhere, you can put it on this cart and then it's secured so it wouldn't fall out. There's usually like a clamp that holds it on. Here's an example in this picture of what an oxygen bank looks like. If you look, there are multiple tanks here and then they feed into this central line which is up here and that would go into the ceiling and then it can go to very like can go to surgery room prep room sometimes the recovery room um 
some of our exam rooms at, you know, because we, we were ER, had oxygen drops. So if somebody wanted to visit their, their animal, we could bring the animal in the room and we could run oxygen to that patient in the room if we needed to. So we had several oxygen drops that all fed from that central location. This is what sometimes an oxygen drop will look like that comes out of the ceiling. What you'll see here that let me explain, there's these different squares and they're different colors because now green is always oxygen. So you know that's where you plug in the oxygen. Um, yellow is for medical air. Um, now medical air, we use it to power our ventilators. So, or, and then I think there's white here too, which would be suction. So you could plug in here if you needed to hook up a suction bucket. So sometimes you'll be in an area and they have multiple drops for different types of, you know, gases or suction, but you know, green always is oxygen. And one thing I will tell you, the oxygen connector also will not fit into these other ports. The medical gases, the connectors are slightly different for the different gases, which also makes it nice. So if you, if you spaced out one day and you're sitting there trying to put it in the yellow connector, it's not going to fit. So, you know, they, so first of all, they're color coded and then they are pin coded. So the pin arrangement is going to be different for the medical gases. And that's a nice uh, safety mechanism. Um, so this is very important. Um, if you look at this picture on the left, so letter E here, that is the knob to turn on the oxygen. And letter A, this is the connector that goes to the tank. Now you have two gauges right here. The first, the gauge closest to the tank is, and there are pictures in your book that will obviously show this more close. Um, this one closest is the tank pressure gauge. So when you turn it on, it should read full 2200 PSI. Obviously this tank is not full because we're kind, well, like I said, I can't read that dial, but it's maybe not quite to the top. The second, the second dial, letter D, is the line pressure gauge. Now, let me show you what letter B is here. B is important. It's called a pressure reducing valve. 2,200 pounds of pressure would blow up your anesthetic machine. It's too much pressure. So when you turn on an oxygen tank right after the pressure gauge, the, the tank pressure gauge, there is a valve and it reduces the pressure to 50 PSI. You, I think in the book it says 40 to 50. That is the amount of pressure that's safe to run to an anesthetic machine. So the next gauge here is telling you what is the pressure in the oxygen line going to your machine. Now that should always read between 40 and 50. And normally this, this B here, that's a little valve that you can like open and close to adjust that pressure. That should be set. You shouldn't have to mess with that unless somebody accidentally went in there and turned it by accident. Say they went to turn on the oxygen and they, they didn't do this, say they turned this. Periodically, somebody should be checking that line pressure gauge, but that should not change. So let me also type that you need to know this. Um, line pressure should be 40, whoa, not 410, 42, if I could type. Okay, so I've typed it here, just some, so the pressure reducing valve's job is to reduce the pressure from the tank to the line going to the machine to 40 to 50 PSI. And the gauge right after the valve is your line pressure gauge. So I have my oxygen pressure gauge, which tells me the pressure of the tank. I have my pressure reducing valve, and then I have my line pressure gauge, and again, that's what it should read. Now, 
and again, these pictures are better in your book, but what you're looking at here is at the top, when you guys, um, when you go to put a tank on a machine, an anesthetic machine, when you get an empty, when you get a full tank, there's a little, there's a little snap valve here. And this is the pin coating system. This here is, well, let me go back to this picture for a second. Actually, no, sorry, it's not there. Oops, sorry. Okay, right here, it's kind of hard to see. This is the yoke connector. So on the anesthetic machine underneath where the oxygen goes, this is an oxygen yoke. And if you look closely, you can see there's two pins and there's a circle here. When you go to your oxygen tank, the two pins go into these two holes and then letter F here fits into letter D. So what you do is you put the tank underneath and then you turn this dial and what it does is it pushes the tank into that yoke and that's how you hook up the oxygen, with, that's how you hook up an E-tank. And that is universal for oxygen only. So again, say you guys had little yellow tanks for medical air. If you went to put a, an air tank in an oxygen yoke, those pins would be further apart or they're arranged differently. So you can't, this is that pin coating system I said that's a safety mechanism. An oxygen tank is the only thing that will fit in an oxygen yoke. So this is the yoke and this is where the tank. Now, when I have you guys for that last week, I can show you how to put on a tank. They'll also probably show you when you're in surgery rotation and can show this to you up close. There are pictures in your book. So right now you just have to take my word for it. And when you put the tank underneath here, it says here, righty tighty, lefty loosey. When you put the tank in, you're gonna roll that to the right to tighten that yoke onto the tank. And then that's, so again, the coating system, the yoke is specific for oxygen and you can't mix that up. Um, and the one thing you also want to check is that now, if you're working off an oxygen bank, like in the storeroom, normally that's left on all the time. Like normally it's on. And if nobody is using oxygen, then no oxygen is flowing. Okay. So normally you don't have to like go turn it on when you guys are in surgery rotation every day when you guys are done with surgery you're gonna turn off your oxygen tank. So when you come in in the morning, if you're anesthetist that day, you have to go in and check your machine. You're gonna to have to turn on your oxygen and see how much oxygen you have in your tank. Um, <clears throat> and when you turn it on, you will check your oxygen pressure gauge or your oxygen tank pressure gauge, you know, and that'll tell you, think of it like your, you go to start your car, you turn on your car and then you're, it tells you how much gas you have. And you're like, you can decide, do I have to go to the gas station? Do I have enough gas to get to school? Do I have to like get gas before I leave school? I will tell you guys that in surgery, sometimes these tanks, there's a little line at the bottom that says empty. And it's just like, I mean, how many of you have pushed your gas tank? It said E, but you're like, I can make it. I don't have to get gas yet. You know, it's not at the bottom, bottom. Like you've got, you know, you probably got like 40 miles. You're like, I can do it. It's, that's the same thing with the oxygen tank. Sometimes you turn on the oxygen. It's going to say that it's empty, but it does go up a little bit. And sometimes you can run a neuter or a quick spay on a tank that looks like it's on E. But what's going to be important and let me go back to this picture. And when you guys are in surgery, one of these tanks is going to be called in use. There's a little tag on the top of the tank. That tells you that that's the tank in use. The other tank should be full. 
So if this one runs out of oxygen, if you guys like run on fumes, okay, awesome. If you're running on fumes and then all of a sudden it goes to empty, you turn off this tank and you can turn on the other tank and then you immediately have oxygen. So the rule is I never do anesthesia without having one full tank and then one in use. So I will just warn you, because I've had students this last surgery rotation, they're like, oh, this tank's on empty. I'm like, we want to use every little drip of oxygen we can out of that. But as long as your next tank is full and hooked up and normally what happens, so say at the end of a procedure, say one runs out and you guys turn on this one. At the end of the day, then what you need to do is take off this empty tank and then put a full one on and then mark this one in use and mark this one full. And then the empty tanks we put back in the cabinet. When the oxygen company comes, they'll come every so often and they will take the empty tanks, they'll bring us full tanks and then they'll refill, refill those other tanks and they'll change out. So in the cabinet, like I will tell you guys, last term before surgery rotation, it was before Christmas break, I went into surgery and literally there was one full tank. The whole cabinet was full of empty tanks. I went through and checked every machine and made sure every, thankfully every machine had one full tank and one in use. And then I just told Dr. Ritz and Ms. Redmond, I was like, FYI, you better order some oxygen because if any of these tanks run out, I said, you have one oxygen tank in the cabinet. So they got, they got new oxygen for the term. So usually that's somebody's job in the clinic to make sure you have enough backup oxygen. But um, I had a machine like this at Purdue, except it was on a gurney. So I had a gurney and the oxygen tanks were underneath. And I had a dog in radiology, a dachshund that we were getting ready to do back surgery on. And all of a sudden, now the other tank on top said full, the tag said full. The tank underneath I was using ran out. I went to turn on my other tank and it didn't turn on. So somebody used that tank and didn't change the tag. It said full. So I literally had to take my patient off the machine, use an ambu bag to breathe for him, run and get another tank, put it on, and then get the patient back on oxygen and anesthetic. And luckily we had some leftover IV agent in case he woke up, which he didn't. I did it fast enough that it wasn't a problem. But that's when it becomes a problem is if somebody doesn't mark the tanks appropriately. So a tank is either empty, in use, or full. So those are the three ways that we mark um, the tanks. And I think, um, uh, if you look in this picture, you can't quite read them. I guess in a book you can, but um, usually red is empty or can't, you know, it, sometimes they're different colors. When, when they deliver oxygen tanks, they're all tagged full. At school, they've got some laminated tags hanging in the cabinet. And then, you know, we can put, once I turn on a tank, I mark it in use. And once I change the tank, I put the full tag on it so that you always know. And those tanks, those tags stay on the tanks so that you know uh, which one you're using. Um, now, when you go to turn on the oxygen on the e-tank, there is a, if you see what this guy is holding in his hand, um, I call it the oxygen key. Sometimes people call it the oxygen knob. There's a little pin here. You can't turn it on with your fingers. So on every anesthetic machine at school, we have this oxygen key and you put it, it's almost like a wrench, but you put it over this pin. And if you turn it to the left, lefty, loosey, righty, tighty, as soon as you turn it to the left, you're going to hear, psh, you're going to hear the oxygen turn on and you just turn it a couple times. You don't have to turn it five, six, seven times. You know, one, usually a couple turns will just open the tank and then you'll see the pressure 
go in and then you'll see that your tank is on. And then we have a little chain that hooks onto the tank so that key doesn't leave the tank. That key should always be with the machine so someone can turn on oxygen. And it's counterclockwise or lefty to turn it on and right to turn it off. Now, as soon as you turn the tank off, you that'll stop the flow. But what I want to explain, when you turn off an oxygen tank, there is still pressure in the line. So when you turn off a tank at the end of the day, your pressure gauge is gonna still read pressure because all you've done is turn off the tank, but there is still pressure within the line. So what we do is at the end of the day, you have to release the line pressure. There's a little button called the flush valve on the anesthetic machine that I'm gonna talk about. When you turn off a tank, what I do is I hit that button and then you'll hear It literally goes And then that's all of your pressure that was within the machine. It's called bleeding the tank or bleeding the line. And then what that does is it gets rid of all your pressure and your tank comes to zero. And the reason we do this Say you turned off your oxygen at the end of the day, you turned off your tank, but you didn't do it. And then your classmate comes in tomorrow and they look at the tank, it looks like there's pressure. And they might think that the tank is on and they go to start the procedure. Well, it's enough oxygen to initially like start and then all of a sudden the oxygen goes because the tank was not on. So at the end of the day, it's part of your grade in the anesthesia is you have to like break apart your machine, turn off your oxygen, bleed your tank, and everything should read zero. Everything should be turned off for the end of the day. Some clinics leave, like I said, some people leave stuff on. Um, if you, like I said, if you're working from a bank, from a ceiling, when you unplug your machine from the oxygen, that's all you need to do for the day. We don't usually leave the machines hooked up to oxygen. I've had people leave oxygen on at the end of a procedure by accident. I did this once, I walked into surgery at school and there was a machine sitting there and the oxygen was just running. Somebody forgot to turn it off. I mean, we're just wasting oxygen, it's going into the air. I'm like, uh, somebody left your oxygen on. So you wanna make sure you turn it off, turn off your tank, everything's done for the end of the day. Um, oh, the other thing is, and I'm pretty strict about this, whenever you turn anything off, it should be easy to turn off and it should be easy to open. This is not farm equipment. You are not turning, and then some people are strong or, trust me, I've worked with a lot of farm girls and they're like, Wah, you know, but you just turn it off till it stops. You don't have to crank it shut. And you don't, you know, because sometimes you go in to be the next person. People do this sometimes with the pop-off valves. There's a valve you can turn to close to bag the patient. Sometimes people, I'm like, I've sometimes had to go get a wrench to open it up because somebody cranked it down too hard. Finger tight, finger tight. And again, you don't want to, and the problem is these anesthetic machines, over time, you can damage these parts if you crank them down too hard especially the flow meters. The, there's very sensitive parts in there. And if you keep cranking them down, you know, it, I said it'll damage them. So you just want to be finger tight. Don't crank things down. Trust me, it becomes a pain. Um, so some of the safety issues or ways that we deal with safety, because number one, it's combustible. So obviously nobody should be, no fire, no smoking, no anything around where you store your oxygen. So it's highly flammable. Um, the yoke attachment, um, again, has a code system. So that is a safety system. The yoke is specific for the gas. There's different yokes for different, you know, the yoke for nitrous is gonna look different than the yoke for oxygen. And that's where the tank, the tank hooks up to a yoke. The yoke hooks up to the you know, usually the anesthetic machine and somewhere there's a line. Um, there is a high pressure release unit. So when you turn on the tank, 
you hear that pressure. It just, you know, and I've already talked about storage, how to store them safely. So there's, there's notes under here, um, you know, to make sure, and we've also talked about chaining them to a wall, keeping them in a rack, never leaning them against a wall. Don't leave them in the middle of the room standing up. Um, you know, if you have to absolutely, you can lay it down and put something up against it till you can put it where it needs to go. That's going to be safer than to leave it standing up. Um, now the color coding oxygen again is green, except it's white in Canada, but you just need to know green. Um, nitrous is actually blue. I think I said black before, but it is blue. And then medical air is yellow and carbon dioxide is gray. Now carbon dioxide is sometimes is used to power like equipment or different tools or um, so carbon dioxide isn't something that you would normally see. You could potentially see nitrous and if you work in, in like a bigger hospital they might have medical air. Again at, at VCA we have medical air tanks because we have animals on ventilators and the medical air is what powers the ventilator. So that's um, why we have to have a yellow drop. And then there's a yellow hose that goes to the ventilator. So everything is color coded, pin coded. Um, here's a better picture of that pin type system. And the carbon dioxide, and know, I know this kind of looks green in the picture, um, but that's actually gray. But you can see the difference. So the hole is kind of about the same location. It's a little bit different, but look at the pins. These pins are set wide and these are a little bit closer together. So again, if you had the yoke, it has to go in to a specific pin and a pin system. So this yoke, this is a safety mechanism. Um, the tank pressure gauge, um, again, it tells you it's in PSI. That's what I want you to know. It tells you how much pressure is in your tank and full in use, or some people have tags that say in service. Um, there are some tags that you, sometimes the, the, the oxygen company will put a tag that'll say full and then it has little perforations. And when you open it, you can take off the full and then it says in use, and then you can rip off in use and then it says empty. So some, the ones we got at Purdue, they all came tagged from the company. So you could just rip off, you know, as soon as you open the tank, you rip off full. And then as soon as you're done with the tank, you rip off in use and then you can leave the empty tag on. At school, I think, probably Miss McClure or someone made laminated tags that you can just hang on the tank and change them every time. So make sure they're labeled and always make sure if you're using a portable tank on a portable machine, you should always have a backup tank. I don't care if your number one tank is full. If something happened and, and something was to like leak or something, you just, you always want to have that backup tank, you know, in case. Now, some clinics will have um, bulk liquid oxygen or sometimes run off of a pressure generator. When we were at Purdue, um, when we got the new small animal hospital, we had an oxygen generator. So we weren't running off tanks. Well, we had tanks for our portable um, anesthetic. So I, you know, if I have to take an animal from radiology to surgery, we had portable anesthetic gurneys that we could take patients anesthetized. But when we had them in the OR and in the prep room, those oxygen lines were coming from an oxygen generator. So then we didn't have to worry about tanks. And some newer clinics, if you guys go to like a newer hospital, um, they actually are having these oxygen concentrators as part of the anesthetic machine and it generates oxygen for that machine. So, you know, for, for school and for learning purposes, you have to know about oxygen tanks. But I always say, like my students that just went on externship, I said, day one of your externship, find your anesthetic machine 
get used to it, find out how it gets oxygen, find out how you set it up. Cause you don't want to just be thrown in to surgery and be like, I've never looked at your machine. I don't know how it works. Where do I turn on oxygen? So there's various ways to get oxygen, oxygen generators, oxygen concentrators, bulk liquid oxygen. But for the most part, a lot of vet clinics work off of tanks, have some either E tanks or H tanks. And then I talked about how much pressure is in your tank, which is measured in PSI, and a full tank should be 2200 PSI. And again, sometimes I have turned on tanks and it's like at 2000, you know, so sometimes it's around 2000, to 2000 but a full tank should be 2200. And as you start to use the tank, Again, it's gonna begin to fall, just like when you drive your car and you start to use gas. It's like that gauge starts to come down. And we will, like I said, we'll run a tank really, really low. We'll sometimes be on E and we're trying to get those last fumes out before we switch our tank over. The thing that I watch, and this is important, what I tell students in surgery is, I haven't talked about the flow meter yet, but the flow meter is what turns oxygen on to your patient. When you turn on an oxygen tank, the oxygen goes in the line to the flow meter. When you wanna turn oxygen on to your patient, you turn on the flow meter and there's a little ball that will raise and it'll show you that oxygen's running. As long as that ball is up and running, you're running oxygen, but sometimes you'll start to see that ball fall. And that means that you're running out of oxygen and that's when you wanna flip over to your other tank. As long as your flow meter is on and running, you're getting oxygen to your patient. But so it's kind of stressful if now, if there's always a tech in there with you. So Mrs. Redmond, or if it was me or someone, you know, I would be looking at that periodically and going, you know, it's not like, you know, because the students get stressed and they're like, I don't want to run out of oxygen. I'm like, we're, we're, we're all kind of paying attention to it, but it's something to uh, keep an eye on. And then when you turn off the tank and bleed the line, it should go all the way down to zero. So you do want to, you do want to like hit that flush valve and bleed it till it goes all the way down. Um, now here is, here's that tag. I was talking about so you can see that it's got like perforations so again most of the tanks when they come from a company they'll come usually with a tag on them and then again you can just rip these off and I think what happened when I was at Purdue was that whoever used that other tank they just never ripped off the tag they probably just turned that tank on but when I went to use it, it had a full tag on it and it was completely empty. Either it was a bum tank from the company, I doubt that. It was probably somebody used it, never turned, ripped off the tag, and then I thought I had a full tank and I did not. Now you can um, turn on one tank, check the pressure, turn it off, bleed the line, then turn on the other tank and check the pressure. Ideally, I should have did that. We are in a hurry. I relied on looking at the tag. So, you know, that's kind of the moral of the story is you can always turn on both tanks to verify, yes, they both have oxygen in them. Um, I've already mentioned this, but a pressure reducing valve, which sometimes people call a pressure regulator, reduces it to 40 to 50 psi they all look a little bit different but what to know about the pressure um, reducing valve it's always after the oxygen pressure gauge so when you turn on oxygen you have your oxygen pressure gauge you have your reducing valve and then this gauge is measuring the pressure going to this line the pressure in the line so this is the reducing valve and remember it should, once that is set, you don't adjust that. That should be universal. I don't care if you have a kitten or a 1,500 pound horse on a machine. 
it doesn't matter the size of the animal because this is the pressure going to the anesthetic machine, not necessarily the pressure going to the patient. And it's not size dependent. It's based on what's safe for the anesthetic machine. And that's universal, 40 to 50 PSI, a large animal machine, small animal machine, it's, that's a safe operating pressure doesn't need to be changed. And then the other thing is the line pressure gauge, which is that gauge is after the reducing valve. And that if your reducing valve is properly set, that should read 40 to 50 PSI. And that tells you that's what's going in the line that's connected to the anesthetic machine. And you know, and again, when you turn off your oxygen tank, you, if, if everything is turned off properly and you bleed the tank, then that line pressure gauge should also read zero. Your tank should read zero and your, because if you've turned everything off, there should be no pressure in the line. So again, at the end of the day, if you're turning off your oxygen, you need to make sure that they are both reading zero and that tells you there's no residual oxygen in the machine. Okay. Are there any questions based on that? Because I think I don't want to. Yeah, get... I have a question real quick. Please, yes. So I just want to recap. So the pressure in the tank is 2200 psi. Mm -hmm. And then when you hook up, well, I guess you would just, I don't know, where does the, where do you get the 4050? That, when does that come in? So when you turn on the tank and then you verify you have how much pressure is in your tank, there's going to be a gauge after that that's called a line pressure gauge. And that's going to tell you how much pressure is in the line because 2200 is PSI is too much pressure to run to an anesthetic machine. So that's, so the pressure reducing valve reduces the pressure from the tank to a safe 40 to 50 PSI. So that gauge has to be after the oxygen pressure gauge, if that makes sense. Yeah. And then what's the next step that takes it down to the 15 PSI that's good for the patient? That is going to be the flow meter, which I'm talking about next. Because when, okay. yeah, so what's going to happen next is you have the line. So you have the line pressure gauge, which is 40 to 50 PSI. The line going to the flow meter, that's the PSI. But the problem is when it comes into the flow meter, the flow meter is going to further reduce that because that can only deliver, I want to say it's a maximum of 15 PSI. It kind of depends on how much flow you run to your patient. But all you need to know is that after the flow meter, it's further reduced to 15 but that's what I'm going to talk about next with the flow meter. Got it. I was just wanting to verify the different no, PSI levels and how it's reduced. Yes. That little valve underneath, you had the two gauges at the top, and then there was like a little wing nut. Sometimes it looks like a knob. It looks different on different machines. But basically, you'll have your tank pressure gauge, and then you have your line pressure gauge. Somewhere in between those, there is the valve. And that is set to 40, 50 PSI. And again, that valve, nobody should ever have to touch that. That once it's set, it should be, you just want to verify that when you turn on a tank, no, you just want to make sure your line pressure is always that 40 to 50 PSI. Because if somebody by accident turned it, it, you could be higher than that. And that's, you know, then it could damage the machine. Thank you. Because, yeah. Okay. And then, yeah, and that's what we'll, we'll I'll kind of talk about that flow meter and how we run the flow meter and how we set the pressure and all that tomorrow. All right. Well, um, I will probably convert this. I got to get ready to go, but I'll probably convert this this afternoon and post it like when I get back from my other class. So if you need something, let me know. If not, I will just see you tomorrow. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.